Institute of American Indian Arts. I'm an Indigenous Local Studies major. Indigenous Local Studies at our campus focuses on the current issues that we're faced with um, in our communities. So anything to do with Indigenous sovereignty, language revitalization, cultural um, revitalization, all of that. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for putting me on the docket and uh, sharing with you just real quickly. Um, when I Don't Know More started, when it broke out, um, I broke down and cried because I was so happy that the world was taking notice and I kind of was praying for that people would pay attention and wake up to what's really going on because in Canada we have a lot of racism and a lot of people um, like to sweep issues under the rug or say it's just someone else's problem. It's a native issue, it's not my problem. But in reality, um, all of the protection that we had for the lakes and rivers and water, waterways have been um, basically destroyed by our, the federal government. They have, um, they have uh, many projects already underway with First Nations, um, existing already for oil and gas. My tribe is one of them that does have a partnership with um, Enbridge Oil, I believe. And so this is something that we're dealing with as Indigenous people, that on one hand we have people that want to um, move and progress, they say progress up and forward, move forward um, with uh, the economy and providing jobs. But on the other hand, we're looking at the blatant um, disregard of the protections for the land, water, and air, and for the people. Because not only did these bills, like um, Bill C-45, it was passed, uh, the Nav Navigable Waters Protection Act, um, that also took away the rights of the First Nations people and said, well, you don't exist, so we can come in, take your land and fulfill these projects that they have. Um, and we can see at the record rate that the bills were passed, that that's really their main concern is, you know, getting that last bit of oil, getting that, um, getting the pipelines in. So with focusing on indigenous sovereignty and speaking about food sovereignty, to me that means, first of all, acknowledging um, that human rights were violated, and what do we need to go into to address that? Um, down here, I'm far away from my home, so what can I do? We can speak out, we can, as you said, we can um, get on the internet, and we can use those network sharing stuff, um, places on the internet like Facebook and all these wonderful sites, but to start at home, for me, practicing um, food sovereignty is what we put into our bodies first. If I choose to go and buy those products and to give my money to those producers, we're sending that clear message saying that's what we want as a society, right? But if we stand up and say, okay, we don't want this, and we, we put our money where, um, where it needs to be in our local agricultural and um, our systems here, our farmers supporting our farmers, indigenous food preparation and um, agriculture, I see that as the first step. What we put in our bodies and what we decide to feed our children. Do we decide to go out on the land and farm? Um, do we, you know, do the agricultural practices like the di um, cleaning the ditches every year that the Pueblos do? These things we can practice them. So if we practice them, if we can practice our um, cultural um, our sacred ways of, of knowing. These are handed down hundreds of years. You know, we do what our grandparents did. They teach us how to work the land and how to come in a good way because you can't just drag your butt out of, you know, out of bed in the morning, go do it with a heavy heart or, you know, I got things to do or I'm, I'm distracted by my cell phone. You come in a good way because you are preparing the food for your whole community. You're preparing your food, you know, they have plots of land set aside for the corn that's specifically grow, uh, grown for those ceremonies. So they're ground and we pray with the corn. I'm adopted Laguna 
and my family um, gave me a name, Zinaniga, and it means gentle rain. So when I try to think about what water means to me and that sacredness that we have with water, um, that's why I speak out, because the water at home is being attacked, and it has been for some time. But I feel that with Idle No More and growing awareness uh, for our communities, that we can really address these really important situations now, and we can create that change that we want to see. I see power in the people. I see people that can stand up and use their voice and make a flyer, make a video, write a book. There's a lot of um, issues that are not even being addressed, especially from an indigenous point of view with um, violence against women, VAWA was just recently passed, we really, everyone was just really behind that and I think that when the community was behind it and they said when they first discovered that indigenous women were not protected, that brought about that social change, right? Everyone's like, no, that's not right. And the more the people, like we have our brothers and sisters in New Zealand and Australia, um, everywhere, the world is watching. And so they're saying, no, you guys can't do this anymore. You have to protect the land and the air and the water and human rights. And, and that that is very important because I don't want my children eating, you know, GMA, GMO food. You don't want your grandchildren to have to totally cover up and, and wear a gas mask and just try to go find a flower out in the field or... Or, or, go f or say, I can't go fishing anymore because, you know, I'm going to die if I eat that. And that's, that's how it is now in a lot of parts, and I'm not trying to dismiss that, but when we look at indigenous food sovereignty, to me, first, the first step is breaking that, is looking at the structure. We're in the, in the settler colonial structure, right? They took the land, they took bodies, and they took resources, and that's the structure that we're living in. So as Indigenous people, when before we even can get to that, that, that frame or get to that, that spot of speaking, we have to deal with this onslaught of, of just surviving, just saying, hey, I'm here. I have an identity. I'm a human being and you can't just take our land and our food and our resources and say, see you later, because they left us for dead. We are dead in the eyes of the Canadian government anyway. So really, when, when, you bring pay, when you bring attention to what's going on, and you have to uncover genocide, you have to uncover violence, you have to uncover all of these things that aren't talked about. But when you lift that up and you just expose the truth, you're exposing the truth, everyone can, can take that, that little effort, or a big effort, whatever you want to do, one little step, you can do it by coming here, educating yourselves, educating other people, passing on what you've learned, having a conversation, whatever that means to you. But for me, food sovereignty starts with education and uncovering the truths that we don't want to talk about. And with Idle No More, I'm very thankful that this movement has progressed and turned into this worldwide movement because the earth needs it. There's, we're, you know, for time running out in that at retrospect, any time that we haven't addressed and made light of this issue is a waste because we're just doing our, our future generations a disservice, I feel. Because it's going to be our kids that take over. We're going we're gonna to be here for a little bit longer, but our children and their children are going to be here. They're going to be the ones dealing with what we're doing, right? The consequences. So, um, and so to wrap up, I think I, I'm out of time. Is that right? I'm, I'm, okay. Um, I've um from Prince Rupert, British Columbia, Canada, and the Simshian have been there for over 10,000 years. <clears throat> and right home at right right now is what we're dealing with on the level at in the community level is that we're dealing with leaders who have partnerships with the oil companies and it's in their best interest. You know, they want to be rich, they want to have money, they want to provide for their communities. So um, when we're dealing with that issue, with leaders 
who aren't going to be going anywhere anytime soon, they want to promote the oil and gas relationships. So I'm really um, focused on trying to get the word out and the more that we as a community and as a global community can bring awareness, that awareness, I believe that the leaders will have to stop and they'll have to say, okay, you know, they're getting louder and they're getting, you know, the momentum's going. And I think if we can keep up with that momentum, we'll, we'll be able to see huge changes because, um, like you see, um, when everyone protested in front of the White House, you had um, Daryl Hannah and um, uh, some other very important celebrities, and they brought, they, they put themselves on the line and said, okay, this is what we need to do to bring awareness to the issue. And so the more that we have that happen, I think that we can really, you know, it's, address these situations, we can get to the change that we want to see done. And I thank you for your time and listening, and um, I would like to encourage you to, um, of course, check out the Idle No More website, and um, keep on supporting uh, your local community with buying locally and, you know, bringing more attention to the GMO um, situation, because it's very imperative that we protect our, our, our food. Because we need, we're all in the same boat. We all need clean food, clean air, clean water. And um, I thank you for uh, coming down here and listening to all the, you know, our wonderful speakers. So thank you so much.